Name a story. Any story. Now, I bet I could analyze that story using this diagram. From a certain point of view, any story follows this cycle or falls somewhere on it. A story that follows the cycle may be more mainstream, more accessible. It's a pattern people are familiar with, to an extent. A story that falls on an area or point in the cycle might be more experimental or psychological. I honestly cannot think of a story that I cannot analyze using the hero's journey in some way. But does that mean all of these stories are mythical? Do they fit into the realm of creative mythology? Are they seemingly Campbellian? In this video, I will discuss the differences between a story that fits the hero's journey model versus a story that is mythical. Mythology, I think of as the uh, homeland of the muses, the inspirers of art, the inspirers of poetry. And to see life as a poem and yourself participating in a poem is what the myth does for you. What do you mean a poem? I mean a, uh, a vocabulary in the form not of words, but of acts and uh, adventures, which is uh, a, a con with connotative, which connotes something transcendent of the action here, and which yet informs the whole thing. So you always feel in accord with the universal being. I think that a lot of fandom discussion about Campbell, especially in the Star Wars fandom, gets stuck in this idea that the hero's journey is a template and nothing more. Really? Wow, it's really strong wow, of you. I've never thought any Ow! But Campbell was studying mythology and finding parallels between stories. The idea of the monomyth was a small but significant contribution to the realm of storytelling compared to everything else that he contributed. What he was trying to teach and inspire was just so much more than that. In fact, the term hero's journey is nowhere in The Hero with a Thousand Faces. That phrasing was first used in the 1987 documentary about Campbell titled The Hero's Journey, The World of Joseph Campbell. From then on, it sort of stuck when referencing Campbell, but Campbell himself only ever referred to it as a monomyth. To clarify right away, I don't dislike Christopher Vogler. I actually think that his work has helped many writers and his contribution to Disney has produced some of the greatest mythic stories of the modern day. However, I found that when discussing and referencing the hero's journey in certain conversations, a lot of people are actually describing Vogler as opposed to Campbell, even though they think they are referencing Campbell. In Campbell's first work, Hero, he first provides this sketch of the monomyth, which consists of a cycle moving counterclockwise, a line separating two halves, and three distinct points that represent separation, initiation, and return. Later in the work, Campbell provides a more detailed diagram, which he annotates, the adventure can be summarized in the following diagram. This diagram has no title, it's also not indexed. Vogler's diagram in The Writer's Journey is the following. As you can see, it goes clockwise instead of counterclockwise, and it is separated into three acts, the rising action, climax, and falling action easily mappable. Now, funny enough, the image that shows up with most frequency when researching the hero's journey online is this one. Now, I myself was even fooled by this. When I first saw it, I thought that this was the original image of the hero's journey. I thought that maybe it was in one of Campbell's books. But this diagram was actually drawn by 4chan user slash me and started popping up on the internet around 2009. Because the user gave permission for anyone to use it, it easily became public domain and even shows up in academic papers. But let's look at this image more closely. It uses known and unknown, which are terms more attributed to Vogler's text than Campbell's. It's clearly labeled the hero's journey. But more importantly, it goes clockwise instead of counterclockwise. Why is the direction important, you ask? We begin to get a separating. The individual begins to find his own path. And the drag, you might say, of the primary mask is gradually thrown off. This is what is known as the left-hand path. The right-hand path is that of living in the context 
of the ideology and mask system, persona system. And so there comes in our world the antithetical mask, the mask of the individual's own life pulling against the other. Campbell often discusses the society and the individual as being both at odds with one another and yet both at balance with each other at the same time. The wheel of society, the community, the religions, the state, the system continues to move clockwise while the individual is pulled along with it until they decide not to be. This is one way to describe the beginning of a journey. The individual, the hero, may decide that they will no longer be carried clockwise by the system. They choose to go against the system and against society to find their own path, thus counterclockwise. When I made my own diagram, I also made it clockwise. It's easier to read, it's comfortable, but after doing this research, I'm changing it. It should be slightly uncomfortable. That's sort of the point. So let's talk about the structure presented by Vogler. First of all, it has a structure. So yours is much more about the broader arc, perhaps, or the story, or the characters, or... Yes, yes, I'm looking at mostly the structure, about how can we uh, line up the events in the story so that it will produce the maximum emotional impact at the end of the film. What Campbell was proposing was not really a structure of a story. Rather, he was providing what the story that we see over and over again means metaphorically. Vogler takes this and lays it over the existing structure of a film, which is something that actually does have a structure. Vogler actually warns readers of the negative consequences of using the hero's journey as a template. It should be used as a form, not a formula a reference point and a source of inspiration. Arguments have been raised against the hero's journey as a pattern. Uh, people say that it has become repetitive, it has become predictable, and uh, I think all that you know, is true. Vogler also clarifies here. I, of course, don't see it that way. I see it as uh, an infinitely flexible thing that's growing all the time and changing, and uh, I, I don't find it uh, predictable. I'm delighted by how uh, it continues to live, and it continues to grow and change. What's being lost between Campbell to Vogler, I think, is the idea of creative mythology, which is not presented by Campbell and Hero, but explored in his later works. Campbell explains that in traditional mythology, symbols are presented as a part of ritual or something that everyone in society will experience. These symbols represent a shared experience and ensure those going through the rituals or the rites that they are not alone. Others have experienced this before them or are currently experiencing it with them. But in creative mythology, this is reversed. An individual experiences something horrific or beautiful, something extremely impactful and moving, and they attempt to communicate that through symbols. If the individual had reached a certain depth of realization, then that symbol will have the force of a living myth to any who receive it. In other words, you can sort of create your own mythology if you have reached a depth of understanding and realization of whatever it is you want to communicate through symbols. My new theory is that it's an incredibly dense gravitational field that's gaining consciousness and is now deliberately f***ing with us. But if we're going to try to get at the ground of myth, we have to deal with the elementary idea, with the archetypes of the unconscious. What do these things personify in relation to life? And what they personify is something that is living and vivid in each of us all the time. Stories are symbols, and stories do this all the time. Artistic animation that is not technically correct, right. but is, is romantically correct. And that's the way myth works. Myth is opening to you the total humanity of yourself, and it evokes energies and it brings them into play. Some of these energies have been repressed and are consequently um, frightening for you. So this is a big part of what makes a story mythical. It speaks to the subconscious and the people who receive the story tend to pull similar ideas from it. This is something I've brought up before. Symbolism with no meaning or no consensus over what it means is just gibberish. Additionally, a metaphor of a metaphor is also just gibberish, especially if you have to explain it. 
stories that aren't mythical aren't bad. A lot of stories rely on being open to interpretation, and that can be very exciting, even fulfilling. And there are stories that can be perceived as being open to interpretation, but have a general consensus on how they are perceived, and therefore can be seen as mythical. It's all in the reception. Because myth is alive, what speaks to audiences changes and evolves. I would say that Vogler has actually brought great mythic insight to Disney during his time as a consultant. I wish I had more information on what he has influenced. Yeah, I just, I had a, uh, a little story about that opening uh, sequence, the Circle of Life sequence. Uh, they had fully mm -hmm. animated that by the time I got there. But my reaction to it was, um, there's something missing. And the okay. missing thing was when Rafiki, who's the kind of the mentor of the story, the kind of magical guy, when he holds up the baby Simba and he shows everybody, I said, wouldn't it be cool if those big clouds up there suddenly opened up and a shaft of light came down and lit up the baby? Mm -hmm. And that makes the little button on the scene. The overarching problem here is not Vogler at all. It's that Campbell is so difficult to read that people would rather read Vogler, myself included. But it's weird once you do start to understand Campbell, when it all sort of clicks into place and begins to affect your life, Vogler's work doesn't really have that effect. It does on story, it does on writing, but Campbell's work transcends that. It's about transcendence, after all. I do think maybe Vogler could do with more of this one question in his work, and I'm sure he asks this all the time when he consults. But what does it mean? What does this mean? What does this mean? What does this mean? If I have to ask, then it's not working. You, when the mythology is alive, you don't have to tell anybody what it means. It's like looking at a picture that's really talking to you. It gets to you. The myth must work like a picture. And uh, it can be explicated, yes, if you've already got it, interpreted, amplified, and so forth. But it must work.